John 17, verses 1 through 5. It says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we just come before you as your people. Uh, whether we're here in person or online, we ask, God, that you would turn our hearts that you, to you, that you would deepen our affections for you, Lord, that you would shape our hearts, that you'd renew our minds uh, in light of what you've revealed. Uh, Lord, we're really good at being glazed over and not seeing all that you're saying. Uh, and so, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just move among us. Uh, and one more time, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. How many of you all have been watching any of the Olympics? How many of you all know that the Olympics are going on? Okay, good. That's everyone, right? Now you know. It's going, they're going on. Uh, you know, we were watching just some, just sporadically, uh, and I was watching people in the opening ceremonies and people entering uh, and with phones, right? I want to capture this moment of me going in to the, to the opening ceremonies. And you get, like, or that makes sense. It's just this, this unforgettable kind of priceless event. And it doesn't matter how many times they've gone. You see people have been there five times, which is abnormal, and they're still in awe that they're at the Olympics. There is some awe. It's a, a kind of a priceless moment, and for that very reason, they're walking around with their own phone. Of the, This is me at the Olympics, you know, like walking out together representing countries. It's a... a priceless moment is the key thing. What we're going to see today is really a priceless moment. It's a chance for us to look in uh, in in one of the most important days in the history of the world, if not, well, pretty high up there. Let me tell you what's been going on. So we've been talking about, this is the, they've been in the upper room, and uh, they know the disciples, so sitting around the table, know that one is going to betray them. Judas is left in the night. Peter is told that he's actually going to betray him also. Uh, He's going to deny him uh, at, at length. Uh, he tells them most recently that they should expect persecution. And then he talks about actually leaving them. He actually says, it's better for me to leave than if I to stay, because the Spirit of God is coming. Now, something that's been going out throughout John's Gospel is he talks about the hour. He says, the hour is not time. It's not time yet. It's like the hour had not come. The hour had not come. Various places throughout John, he says, the hour has not come. But he doesn't say that here. Today, he says, basically, the hour has come. They've been walking with him for about three years following this, this astonishing man who was not just a man for about you know, three years, watching him do impossible things, humanly impossible things. He taught like no one else. John talks about the Word becoming flesh. The one who spoke life into existence is actually walking among us, and he is teaching them in the upper room. And today what we're going to see is this kind of this invitation to listen in on one of the most priceless conversations to touch human ears. A sacred moment. The first thing we see is a sacred moment. Uh, I've told this story before, but it, it's uh, one that, that I remember really well. My grandmother uh, passed away with a breast cancer um, years ago. I think she had it for like 25 years. But uh, in the last hours of her life, um, she was completely coherent. Like she was thinking fine until the very end, but we knew within hours that she would pass. Uh, and, and so, uh, how old would I have been? I have no idea what I would have been early college student, whatever. Uh, so I go to my, but she, she's going to pass away in, really in, in their bedroom. And they kind of gave, given us opportunities to kind of say goodbye, basically. And I went in to her room, and it's just her. I think you were with me, right? So Catherine was with me. And uh, we, we go in, and one of my concerns for just anyone is that you could be a part of church gatherings your whole life and not actually know Jesus. This is my grandma. I'm like, if I'm going to ever get anything right in my life, <laughs> this one matters to me. And I said, uh, Nanny is her name. Uh, I said, I have no reason to think one way or another, but the Bible says us to, to search, to be sure that we know that we're in the faith. And so I asked her, I said, do you know if you were to die, if you die tonight, and she knew within hours that she would, that you would be with uh, God in, in heaven. And she said, oh, I, no question. She goes, I know he's here right now. And I remember thinking, I was not as conscious of, and that wasn't a gospel statement, by the way. She had trusted Christ in a different time. 
in her early in her teenage. She went on to describe it, how she came to faith. But what struck me is I was not as conscious as she was of God's presence. And she said, I mean, without blinking, and there was a certain, <laughs> for me, check of like, oh, you're quite clear <laughs> on what's going on. And God's grace was, was quite present. Actually, another pastor uh, came and visited maybe that same day and came out. He's from a really big church, and we've done it for years. And he came out, and he goes, that was intense. Independent, talked to her by himself. And I was just like, all right, well, there you go. But what I, let me tell you what, what, what I remember was both her confidence, her joy, her expectation of being with God. Um, and <laughs> I was kind of, just so you can know what I was thinking, I was like, I'm in a very precious window of time. And I'm about to introduce questions about my grandma's salvation to or her on her deathbed. So in one sense, I was like, what a jerk, is what some people, by the way, would think. And on the other side, I thought, if I love her at all, and I actually believe this is true, what a jerk for me to be quiet. And so against all of my everything, I was like, Nanny, <laughs> I need to ask you something. I, and, and I wasn't rude. It wasn't anything like, all right, here's what happened later. So after we leave the room, she actually had, there was a baby monitor because they were kind of watching her throughout. And my grandfather enters from the other room, and he'd been listening. And I thought, that was, that was interesting. He didn't say anything, but it was obvious. that there was, It was a, a, a holy moment of both just frailty, of the reality of life and death, and then the hope of the gospel. And this is a, a, a moment that I still remember really, really well. Really, really well. This is not the same as what we're about to see today, but it's the best glimpse I have for you of my life of something like this. Look, if you would, in John 17, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> so after he's, he's been teaching them and tell them all these things that are happening, Jesus, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven. So we're like looking in on really a holy moment, listening in. Jesus so spoken these words. He lifted his eyes to heaven. He says, Father, addresses the Father. He says, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give him eternal life to all who have given, uh, you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Within hours, Jesus would be crucified. Not many hours later. It's not immediate, but not many hours later, Jesus will die. And he knows it. He's been saying it all along. When he says these praise, we get to listen in on a prayer of the Son to the Father. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Again, we talked about this for all this time. People come to take him, and he's like, the hour's not here, and it would not happen. <laughs> he does not get taken against his will. If he gets taken, it's because he chose. That's just what you need to know. It doesn't matter what it looks like. He chose. But what you need to get, uh, he, he also says, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. What you need to make sure you know is in Old Testament thinking, God cannot give his glory to another. He cannot give his glory to another. And so these are are uh, statements of a deity. He's making a claim of God. Glorify me. Again, glorify your son, that son may glorify you. Now, glory means majesty or goodness, praise or honor. Majesty, goodness, praise or honor. I like the way Kent Hughes describes this. The glory of God is seen in the revelation of who he is and what he is. The more the revelation, the greater the display of his glory. Let me say that again. The glory of God is seen in the revelation of who he is and what he is. The more the revelation, the greater the display of his glory. Think about a few passages in Scripture. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Right? In observing that we're on it. One of my kids brought me a picture. We're on this, you know, yesterday or maybe the day before. And I was like, yeah, and we're conscious, thinking about it. The planet is huge, and yet it's personal. It's not impersonal. The heavens declare the glory of God. Night after night, they pour forth speech. There's no place when they're not heard. Everywhere, anywhere. Atheists, atheists stand in awe. I've told you that many times. I have an atheist friend who looked at, at the wonder of the universe and stands in awe, and yet he has no one to think, right? I do. The heavens declare the glory of God. 
These just declare it. So this is how you get glimpses. They reveal something about who he is. But here's the deal. Scripture says this in Jesus. In Jesus, Jesus the Son is the radiance of God's glory. Hebrews 1.3, he's the radiance of God's glory. When you see Jesus and who he is and how he is, which probably means you look again at him, there's a lot that's on display. God is glorified. You find out a little bit more about who he is. In this context, glory is revealed in the cross. It's still coming, but the hour is at hand. He has accomplished the work the Father sent him to do. He's about to do some more. So glory is, is seen in who and what God is like. So think about the cross. Someone explained this well. Hanging there. So think about the cross and, and how God is glorified in the cross. Hanging there suspended between earth and sky. Jesus glorifies God in the way the world has never seen. Never has the holy justice of God and the holy love of God been displayed so powerfully together. The holy justice of God, that, that all are guilty, and yet the love of God, that he makes a way that guilty people are, become his. The holy love of God have been displayed so powerfully together. We cannot adequately understand how glorious God is without the cross. There's something that is gained. There's a glory that's revealed in the fact that this God died for you. The heavens declare something, and actually the cross says something about who he is. We cannot adequately understand how glorious God is without the cross. There we see his holiness, that he is not fine with sin. Don't ever wonder about it. He is opposed to it actively. His condescension, he humbles himself takes the form of a man, but not just a man. He's treated like a criminal, a guilty man. His wrath and his love. He hates sin. Never question. In the midst of understanding that he is very gracious, don't ever play with God. He hates sin, but yet he loves us. His justice and his mercy all are perfectly displayed through the death of his son. This gives glory to God. When you look at the cross, you learn a little bit more about who he is and how he is. If you look back at verses 2 and 3 now, since uh, you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ. There's a quality and a quantity. It never expires. He saves us. You get to know him, but the fact is you get to know him forever, and you are made to know and love him. There is no person on the planet who can satisfy this for you. Spouses are great. I really like her, but she cannot fill my heart for God. That doesn't, that doesn't knock on her. I cannot do the same for her either. Right? That's, we were made for him, and, and companionship is right and good, uh, but the fact is God is who we're made for. I like the way um, J.I. Packer was studying this with the men's discipleship. By the way, anyone should read it. It's a good book. But he talks about this relationship. He says, imagine now if, if we're going to be introduced to someone who we feel to be above us, whether in rank or intellectual distinction or professional skill or personal sanctity or in some other respect. The more conscious we are of our inferiority, the more we shall feel that our part is simply to attend to this person respectfully and let him take the initiative in the conversation. Think of meeting the Queen of England or the President of the United States. Just positionally. You don't have to love these people to understand that there would be a fitting, a fitting way to approach them, and you wouldn't automatically have access to them and just say, hey, let's go hang out, tell me your thoughts about you know, the morning breakfast or whatever. You wouldn't approach them like this. He says, think of meeting the Queen or the President of the United States. We would like to get to know this exalted person, but we, we fully realize that this is a matter for him to decide, not us. If he confines himself to courteous formalities with, with us, we may be disappointed, but we do not feel able to complain, right? So if he stays formal, hi, nice to meet you, thanks for coming, you're not like offended like, all right, well, he owed me more. You might be like, I kind of wish we'd been able to talk more, but you wouldn't feel like they owed you more, right? After all, we have no claim on his friendship, but if instead he starts at once to take us into his confidence, okay, exalted person is like, hey, come sit with me. and tells us frankly what is in his mind on matters of common concern. This is something I care about. You care about. And if he goes on to invite us to join him into a particular undertaking he's planned, 
hey, I'm going to do this thing. I'd like you to be involved in it. And he asks us to make ourselves permanently available for this kind of collaboration whenever he needs us. Hey, anytime I need this, would you be willing to be called on? Whenever he needs us. Then we shall feel enormously privileged and will make a world of difference to our general outlook. If life seemed unimportant and dreary hitherto, it will not seem so anymore. Now that the great man has enrolled us among his personal assistants. You're no longer just known, hey, formal person. Now you have access. You have this relationship. Here is something to write home about and something to live up to. You belong to this one who you have access to. Now this, now this, so far as it goes, is an illustration of what it means to know God. Well, might God say through Jeremiah, let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and know me, knows me. It would be great if I'd read that well. doesn't matter. Read it again. Let him that glories glory in this. If you want to be proud about something, you want to delight in something, you want to tell the planet about something, glory in this that he understands and knows me. That's what God is talking about. This is kind of an amazing thing. This is eternal life, is actually what Jesus says, that they may know him. You were made for this, and the fact is, here's this, he has made it possible. Not just possible, not just, not just possible, you can actually do this. He calls you, he convicts, he draws, he pursues us. On this night, they're listening in. And this is the kind of stuff they hear. This is eternal life. They may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Look at verses 4 through 5. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. The work that the Father has sent him to accomplish. This is like he includes miracles, his calling of discipleship, but actually looks forward to the cross as well. He will fully finish what he came to do. The reality of the cross means the reality of forgiveness. Because Jesus actually died and actually rose from the grave, your sin is actually forgivable. Look at verse 5. Glorify me with the glory I had before the world existed. This is an ancient, eternal glory. Jesus is not just a man. He is absolutely a man. He is fully man. But he is fully God, and they are they are inseparable realities. He added a body. He didn't have to do this. But now that he has one, he's kept it, actually. He had this, but he has this eternal glory. He, he, the name Jesus, I think, came later. He, he adds a human nature. He needs a name that's going to make sense to us, not to himself. And he, he makes himself known. He has this eternal glory. They're listening in in the sacred moment, and they hear this kind of stuff. The second thing I want you to see in this sacred moment <clears throat> is that they overhear Jesus pray about five things. Now, the fact is there's probably more, but basically five things stand out here that we will see. They, he talks about identity. He talks about unity. He talks about protection. He talks about joy and talks about sanctification. I kind of want to explain those so that when you see them, maybe they'll stand out better. Identity. I think one of the most important things you can get in your life as a believer is to understand who you actually are. When you know you've been forgiven and you've been loved, and you have a new nature, your new creation, um, and that is part of actually who you are. You live in this. You don't require people's, you know, you might want people's approval, but you don't desperately need it. You're accepted by the living God. You've been forgiven. You don't have to be identified with your sin, right? Right? You may have done some terrible things, and you have, and I have. But because of Christ, I don't have to live as though I'm only that. I get to live in light of Jesus. So identity is something he talks about. Unity is something maybe surprising. He talks about this being a priority. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but unity, you understand that concept. Protection, he knows that there's there's a lot that's come. He's promised they're going to suffer. They're going to have difficulties. He's promised that. It's like, but it's okay. Yeah, I'm going with you. You're not going to be alone. He actually talks about joy. Now consider what's coming to Jesus. Within hours, he will die. And yet he's talking about joy. He prays that they would have joy. And then finally, sanctification. 
Sanctification is becoming in practice what you've been declared in truth. It means that if I've been born again and my nature has changed and I belong to Christ, that He is going to conform me and to make me like Jesus actually, so that my patterns, my practices, what I do, what I think about become like Jesus. That's sanctification. All right, now let's look at the passages. Look at verses 6 through 8 of chapter uh, of 17. And continue this prayer is continuing to go, go on. He says, I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from me, for I've given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them and come to know that in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So Jesus recalls and repeats what they've seen. They've seen a lot. They've seen a lot. He says, I've revealed your name to them. The Father's works and His words reflect who He is. He's given them words and they've received them. Many have heard about Christ. These receive them. They know the truth. They know Jesus is the Son of God. And they actually say, you know, who do you say I am? He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, Peter says, and then Jesus tells Peter, the Father has told you. He's revealed this. So they actually know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Um, but so the, the first thing that they, they hear is a prayer about identity. They're hearing him pray, and he's talking about them knowing the truth. Can you imagine hearing that? Your name, Jonathan, knows the truth. Your name knows the truth. And the, the Son is praying. Look at verses 9 through 12. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which I've, which I've given, which, excuse me, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the Scripture may be, might be fulfilled. Those who have believed. He talks about these. They've already believed. He's praying for these who's, who've believed. In verse 10, he talks about, he says he's glorified in them. Isn't this interesting? Right? It makes more sense. The son's glorifying the father. But feel the weight of the son of God saying, I'm glorified in those guys. That it points to God and his goodness. And you can think about where this plays out in Acts. Like the Holy Spirit comes, remember? And these guys who've been affectionately called the hillbillies from Galilee are speaking to some of the most powerful people in their tradition with fire. The hillbillies from Galilee, the country people from Galilee, are speaking with boldness, and they're saying some things. They're saying, you know as well as I know that, that who he was. <laughs> like, you saw it. These are not done in a corner. These, these back hill skies, in general, most of them, are saying, you know full well. And the Spirit of God convicts all these people. And, I mean, they're speaking with boldness. And what do they say? What do they attribute? What do the Jewish people attribute? What do they say? They say, he's been with Jesus. <laughs> like that's, what, that's their conclusion, is that these guys have been with Jesus. That's what the credit was. Isn't that interesting? That these guys who are so simple, first of all, that Jesus chooses them and uses them to make him known. I was talking to someone really recently, yesterday, uh, about who is, who is a, a really gracious person, loves God. And, and I, I said, how can I be praying for you? And he said, just that God would use me. I think we could almost end the sermon and go home right now. Just that God would use me. And I told him, I said, look, you know something. He, he noted missionary life and where I've come from and things like that and the influence the missionaries had on maybe him coming to faith. And I said, look, you need to make sure you understand that you probably could be more effective in your context than the missionaries you're talking about. <laughs> like, and, and at your work, you, you would be heard more quickly than any pastor in this church. So you're already in the game. Just recognize who you are. God is glorified in normal people making Him known. 
Like I said before, the guy in China who came to faith, it wasn't like a rock star who loved to faith. It was just a simple person. He doesn't need rock stars. He needs just basic people to actually know who they are in Christ and to boldly just say, look, here, he, he, he's true. And a witness just says, this car hit that car. I said, that's all you got to do. Just say, look, what do you do in your life? Tell them that. You start there, that's a great beginning. But in this day, he talks about the disciples, that they, they glorify him. Pretty interesting. Look at verse 11. And then he talks, go back to verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your, in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. What in the world is going on? The Son of God, who is, there's only one God, by the way. There are not three gods. There's only one God. Everything in essence that is true of the Father is true of the Son, is true of the Spirit. There is one God uh, who exists in Trinity, three persons. He's praying to the Father, and um, he says some things. He prays that they would be one as we are one. Now, he, he's not making a metaphysical claim about the essence of godness. He's talking about their unity. And he actually says this, that he wants the disciples to, in some sense, reflect the unity of God. What is that? This is a, a burden, <laughs> like... Because he doesn't leave it at the disciples. We'll see that a little bit later. The fact is, this is what he's praying, though. And do you think Jesus was heard? Oh, yeah. Oh, he was heard that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you've given me. I've guarded them. So he, there's this profound unity that should be for normal Christians, that we have a common mind, purpose, unqualified mutual love, togetherness in mission. And it's glimpsed in Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost. There, he prays for unity that mirrors the Trinity. I mean, what bigger would you be looking? That you can't do a bigger. You're in charge of making oneness, which just really hoses divisions really hard. Things that we might be comfortable with, like oh, you know, it stinks that we're not talking ever. To him saying, no, that they should be one, like we are. That's interesting. Uh, rowing is a good picture of unity. Someone else said this. Unity is the byproduct of each disciple clinging to the truth about God. So it's not just ignoring things that really matter. You should dis- There is a place for disagreement that you should do. You can't actually can't, you can't rightly divide the Word of God by not having a standard. You can't say that there is one way to salvation. You can't say Jesus is the way to salvation if you can't actually make a truth claim. So he's not saying to have no truth claims. He's saying in what is most fundamental, you should be united. So think about rowing. You know the rowing boat? And often, you ever notice that the rowers are not facing where they're going? You ever notice that? What is that? Who wants to go backwards at high speeds? Think about what this is. So in the sporting game of rowing, unity is he. Each oar must enter and exit the water at precisely the same time if the boat wants to maintain speed. The way the rowers stay in sync is by listening to the coxswain. Who knew that word before today? All right? Four of you. Just kidding. Maybe more. Uh, the coxswain doesn't row. He sits in the back of the boat, calls out the strokes. The coxswain is the only one who faces forward. The only one who faces forward. What? you got to trust that. I don't want a bad coxswain, <laughs> personally. Uh, coxswain is the only one who faces forward. The entire crew must listen to the coxswain's commands and respond. What then happens? What, uh, when that happens, the boat flies over the waters. Unity doesn't come from everyone rowing their hardest, but from everyone submitting to a single voice. As the disciples submit to the voice of God, they grow more and more of the same mind. Their thoughts, their desires, and intentions begin to mirror God's, and they experience, listen, unity that is unfamiliar to the world. There is a unity that occurs 
among humanity, right? The Olympic Games kind of give you glimpses of that. Sometimes there's some unity about it, sometimes. You can't have Christian unity there. Maybe you could, there'd be Christians there. <laughs> but, but there is a oneness of when there is one voice who's speaking, and you're trying to conform to what he's saying. And you recognize you have differences of thought, you know, granted every single topic, but it, it is most fundamental, this is what God wants, and I want to do it. There's one voice. And they're about to go through the storm. He, he, all this stuff is in the context of what is coming. He's about to die. And these are the kinds of things he's saying. That who they are, they're his. That they are to be one. He prays finally for their protection. He says they are kept, he was kept by Jesus. And the only one lost, unfortunately, was expected. It was Judas. Look at verses 13 through 19 now. Now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of, this, of the world, just as I am not of the world. I did not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, and your word is truth. As they sent me into the world, so I've sent, you, sent them into the world. For their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Okay, I've just made a decision. So I'm going to punt the second. The, uh, there's a last leg to this that I think I just don't want to rush through because I think it really matters, especially to our church body. Because unity is what we are prayerfully walking through uh, collectively. And so this, the third piece of this is coming next week. But I, don't, I do want to finish this. So verses 13 through 19 is what we'll do today. Uh, but I want you to look carefully. Jesus prays in this, again, same context. It's still a heavy moment, a heavy time, and he prays for joy. He prays, he goes, but now I'm coming to you. He's praying to the Father, these things I speak to the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He prays for joy. Fulfilled in his people despite their struggle. Jesus prays that they may be delighted. Don't forget what's coming to him. They may be delighted despite the formidable foes which will confront them. The disciple community can experience the joy of Christ and Jesus prays that they will. It is surely remarkable that he can refer to his own joy when he knows that the most appalling suffering is about to engulf him. Nor is it a passing or spasmodic joy that he refers. It is a full measure of his joy. Neither the hostility from without nor the apostasy within has quenched the joy of Jesus, nor need to do so in the case of, of the disciples. Wow, this is amazing. So he knows that both that they are going to be persecuted tremendously and that he's about to die. And in the middle of that, he's praying that they would have joy. And not just token survival joy. His joy. You ever think of joyful Jesus? My campus pastor had laughing Jesus. It was a picture. It was actually respectful. I think it's too often that we don't really regard and know this. He is satisfied. Jesus is not boring. He is not hollow. He made humor. We laugh at our house all the time. That is a gift. It trades on what's true. Joyful Jesus is praying that they would be fulfilled in joy. He said they're going to be hated because of, the, because of their kingdom mind obedience. But he actually says, don't take them out. He prays, don't take them out. Keep them from the evil one. Protect them. Verse 17, he prays for their sanctification, that they would become in practice what, he's, what they're declared. But they're going, to be, they're going to be conformed, they're going to mature through his word. So he's praying that these people be people of the word. And then finally, verses 18 through 19, he sends them, he commissions them. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. So just, we're going to end here, but I want you to see this. That he Over here, the Son of God, hours before he will die, he, he prays that the Father will return, return his glory that he's had forever. He reminds them of eternal life, that what it means to know and love God, that is satisfying and fulfilling. And then he prays specific things. He prays for these, that they would kind of know who they are. 
He prays for their unity that would mirror the Trinity. He prays for their protection, that they would stand when they're tested because it's coming. They're going to be tested, and their faith is going to be... In, I mean, how, how many deconversion stories have you heard recently? They're not a few. That doesn't freak me out. Because I'm like, that doesn't change anything. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> but it's, I'm like, I'm not, I didn't start believing because of you. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? It doesn't, shake, it doesn't shake me. I'm like, I did not start believing because that guy did. Like, that is not who, I, my faith is not in that person or that song or this person. Nothing. Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. He is faithful. He changes lives all the time. You have just as many people coming to faith. They don't mention those. They don't, they're not quite as cool to hear, I guess. He prays for protection because they're going to need it. They're going to have to stand when all this stuff comes. And you can imagine if you're in a persecuted place. Ours is a little protected at the moment. Or you'd need that. He prays for joy. That's cool that they would not just survive, that they would be satisfied in Him. And then He prays for sanctification, because they're going to need that too. They're going to have to mature. You don't just go through this stuff and have joy with thin faith. And I think He would pray that for us. The fact is, the next part that we'll look at next week talks about, He actually prays for us. I have to, I have to read just the beginning of it. John 17, 20-26, I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus prayed for you. And you better believe it was answered. So what, what does this tell us about God? I only had two things that I always do. I'm studying the Bible and just give you a side note for you. I always ask this question, like, what does it mean? Like, what does it actually mean? You need to get that right. Because it does mean something. God intended for us to know something specific. What does this tell me about God? Tell me about who he is, how he is, what he loves, not love. What does this tell me about humanity? What what are people like? What is this, how does this require Christ? When you look at this passage, we see that God is sovereign over life. He is in control. He can talk about joy knowing he's about to die because he's in control. He can talk to people who will flounder, who are hurt, Wounds shake you sometimes. It's not surprising people have questions. He's praying that they would endure and that they would have joy. I don't know. There's a lot more. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we uh, study this passage that is, I think, uh, really, it is a, a sacred moment for us to kind of look in here and to think, what were you saying that night? It's no light thing. And yet, the kind of things that you were praying for were, should tell us something. You're praying and talking about eternal life. Life that is abundant, satisfying, fulfilling what we were made for in knowing and loving God. That we have access to this flawless king. You have chosen to make yourself known, and you call on us. Better than the king of any country, better than any president. We have access to the living God. You've called us to, to know who we are to recognize that some of us are in need of a Savior, and we need to turn and trust Him. Some of us need to receive Your grace to go through difficulty. But I pray that joy would be something that would mark today, that people remember that that in the middle of one of the darkest moments, you were praying that they would have joy. So, Father, I pray, I don't know really what you're going to do, but I pray that Your Holy Spirit would move, that You would strengthen us, that You'd make us more mature, that we'd be people of Your Word, that we would really care deeply about what you care about, that this unity, the fact that you chose to use the Trinity is what you're wanting us to reflect as as believers, makes war with trivial divisions. So I pray that that would be pressed into. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.